WVUAFM, Tuscaloosa. Hello, everybody. This is WVUA 90.7 FM, the capstone, and welcome to episode number 30, Steph Curry. Curry, baby. Of the Full Court Press Podcast. My name is Jamie Martinez, and I'm joined by Alex Chasen and not Nick Atkinson, who won't be with us today since he's feeling under the weather. Just a bit. On today's episode, look forward to league news and the last part of our current NBA Power Rankings. Today, we'll be going over rankings 15 through 1. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at FCP Podcast underscore UA and on TikTok at FCP underscore podcast. With that being said, let's get into it. Let's get right into it. John Morant returned Wednesday night since he stepped away from the team in early March and his eight-game suspension. As we've talked about on the previous two podcasts, John Morant stepped away from the team to deal with some personal issues. He went to some facility down in Florida to get some mental help. He's still going to be seeking out that help throughout the rest of this season and into the near future, but he is back. Post game, post eight game suspension. Excuse me. He came off the bench though in his first game back, which is very interesting. Their head coach Taylor Jenkins said he would, and then he did come off the bench against Houston though. In 24 minutes, he had 17 points on 46 percent from the field, two three pointers made, four rebounds, five assists, two steals, and one block, and an absolute posterizer dunk over KJ Martin. John Morant's back, baby. I love to see it. He is today's Derrick Rose. Hopefully, he doesn't go down the same injury path. Hopefully, he follows a path of a more Westbrook-esque athletic type of point guard where he stays healthy most of his career. And just, oh my gosh, Jamie, watching John Morant explode. in this dunk over KJ Martin, it was kind of like a double-clutch dunk. Crazy. It's crazy. Like a Batman mask on. It's like what we did as kids when we were playing bedroom basketball or wherever you have that mini hoop. It's yeah, we like, had it on our door frame. I, actually, I, I broke mine one time because I dunked too hard. Exactly. It's like doing dunks like that, but you're only like getting a foot off the air. But this is 10 feet in the air. It's crazy. It's wow. astonishing to see what happens. It's great to see him back. It's great to see John Morant back, like I said. In 24 minutes, 17 points, 5 assists, 4 rebounds, 2 steals, and 1 block for the point guard. Go. John Morant, he's back, baby. And the Grizzlies are about to make a playoff push another return this one is arguably a bit bigger and a bit more newsworthy in the way of he's missed 51 games cat Carl anthony towns has been out since november 28th with a grade three calf strain he made his return also wednesday night just like john morant against the atlanta hawks with in 26 minutes 22 points 44 percent from the field Four rebounds, which is a little lackluster for a Carl Anthony Towns. But yeah. like Jamie said, he's just getting back he's into it. Now. Exactly. Like he said last week. I mean, not last week, last episode. He's yeah. getting back into it. That's not really his role anymore. Yeah, they're probably keeping him on the perimeter a bit more, uh, trying not to get that calf, you know, worked up again. He's the best shooting big man we've ever seen. So they're probably just sticking him to that role until he's uh, more game ready. He has some more games under his belt. We'll see those rebound totals go up in the future. Exactly. And four rebounds, like I said, three assists, two steals. And on top of this, in his return, he hits the game-winning free throws to beat the Atlanta Hawks. And I remember at his post-game interview, he was all ecstatic. He was all giddy just about being back on the court and getting those game-winning free throws for the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Hawks, for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Yeah. And let's see what happens with the Timberwolves. I mean, they're in a tough spot right now. They are currently the a seven seed in the West, so they're 37 and 37. In they're, five, they're, in play, they're in the play-in, and they could jump up to the six seed. The Warriors are 39 and 36. A few games difference there, which is the first time in a while. There's yeah. a, like a two-game difference between seedings. So we'll see what happens on that standpoint. But jumping into Ben Simmons, his injury, play struggles, it all continues. Let's get into it. Persh Amsarania of The Athletic Nets say Ben Simmons now has a nerve impingement and his back will remain out of action while size determined best course of treatment. Jamie, what's your take on, obviously, I mean, I guess you can talk about this injury, but more just like the whole saga of Ben Simmons from being an all-star in Philly to then not even playing a whole season last year to then coming back and just nothing's really going on Yeah, for him. so the story of Ben Simmons has obviously been tragic. He uh, gets drafted to the Sixers first overall, misses his rookie year due to injury. Exactly. Comes back his second year, wins rookie of the year, because the NBA, you could do that. Um, 
and he's an all-star in Philly. He's Joel Embiid and uh, Ben Simmons are dominating the NBA. Trust the process is in full force, and they're looking like title contenders. But I would say right after the bubble or in the bubble, Ben Simmons just flops. He's completely afraid to take open shots. He's passing the ball, playing way too passive. People are forcing him to shoot the ball, which is his absolute weakness, and he gets absolutely exposed. Then he gets injured again, doesn't want to play for the Sixers, goes to Brooklyn. And in Brooklyn, he's been absolutely disappointing. And now we see he's hurt. The Nets are on a five-game losing streak. They're going to miss their big man and one of their primary playmakers. So the Nets are not looking good going into this, the playoffs or the plan, whatever they manage um, you know, putting up in this final stretch of the season. So um, for the Nets, you hate to lose Ben Simmons. He's a vital piece of your team. But if you're Ben Simmons, I don't know. I feel like you really got to take a look at yourself and improve yourself during this time of injury. And... Yeah, I mean, this is just terrible to see. I think the Nets do survive this, though, because ever since the beginning of the season, his minutes have dwindled down. Yeah. Like, he started off the season playing a ton of minutes with KD and Kyrie. You know, they were trying to, like, oh, this is going to be a championship team. Ever since the peak of the season, his minutes have dwindled all the way down to middle school bench minutes. Yep. And you hate to see it for someone who is so highly thought of coming into the NBA. Jamie, you just described it on He's one get. of the best point guards in the NBA. Exactly. He was. I mean, he was a he's a 6'10 point guard. Magic Johnson. That last time we saw that exactly it was Magic Johnson. I mean, it's getting a little more common coming back into play with the Ball Brothers, but seeing a big point guard is unheard of. Yeah. His weakness has always been he couldn't shoot. He still can't shoot. If he could get a shot, he'd be like a Giannis because Giannis can shoot enough, right? Mm -hmm. He's exactly like Giannis driving to the paint. If he had a shot, he'd be Giannis, but sadly he has never gotten that piece of his game. And now he's at the point where he is a bench player in the NBA. Think about that for a second. He was an MVP candidate at one point. Exactly. Is Kevin Durant getting back into action? Let's talk about it. Phoenix Suns 13-time All-Star. Kevin Durant has been out with a grade two sprained ankle for a bit of time now not too long but a couple weeks and he's progressing toward a potential return to action this coming Wednesday versus Minnesota barring any setbacks league sources tell Sham Sharania of The Athletic I thought this man was going to be out to at least the playoffs if not a little bit more because that's what the report was at first was two to three weeks two to three weeks would have been like the first round of the playoffs but it looks like he's coming back this coming Wednesday we will let you guys know if it's official on our Friday podcast with that said, what do you think about this, Jamie? So, for Phoenix, they obviously just lost to Sacramento in a fairly close game up until the third quarter where Sacramento put up 45 on their heads um, in a game where they needed KD against the perennial powerhouse in the West. But it's going to be great that you're getting them back for the playoffs. Um, if anybody's going to hate to see this, it's going to be Clippers fans because right now they're matched up to play in the playoffs. And I guarantee you, if there's no Paul George for that, they're going to hate to have to play KD and Devin Booker. So, Phoenix, this is a perfect time for your superstar to come back and win you some games in the playoffs and hopefully make a championship push. Because if Kevin Durant comes back right now, right now, like Jamie just said, the Clippers are the fourth seed, Suns are the fifth seed. They could switch any day now because yep. the Clippers are 39 and 35, the Suns are 38 and 35. So there's like a game, half a game separating the two. That could switch, and I think the Suns definitely want to switch that because I don't think playing on the road in L.A. against the Clippers... Kawhi, PG, Russ, that whole team, it would be very easy for them. So I yeah. think they do want home court advantage looking into that series if that is what the matchup becomes. Jumping into the Warriors, though, their perimeter, premier, excuse me, perimeter defender Gary Payton is scheduled to make his 22-23 Warriors debut. You're wondering why I say that? Because a lot is kind of interesting with him. He was on the Warriors championship team last year, signs with the Portland Trailblazers in this offseason because they could give him a little bit more money. And then at the trade deadline, the Warriors like, no, we need some more defense because our defense is terrible. It's still pretty bad. So they trade for Gary Pe- Gary Payton. He had some issues going on with, I believe, his ribs or oblique area, yeah. somewhere, somewhere there. But he's coming back. He's going to be making his Warriors debut as soon as Sunday. So that means today on Monday's podcast, he could have came back Sunday. We don't know because we record this on a Saturday. But he is scheduled to make his return, or it says could join the Warriors lineup as soon as Sunday against Minnesota. You notice a lot of these players are returning against Minnesota. Minnesota. I don't know what it is. I mean, Carl Towns just came back too. Exactly. So very interesting. Anyways, what does this mean for the Warriors? Obviously, the Warriors are the 6th right now in the West, 39-36, and a completely tight packed Western Conference. I'm going to continue to say that. But this is a defender that helped them win the championship last year. Do you think this 
even makes a difference for a team that has been so bad on the road? So I think this is a special circumstance for the Warriors where you're getting a new player and, um, you know, he's got to develop team chemistry. But in the case of Gary Payton, he already has that team chemistry. He was with the Warriors basically his entire career. He goes to um, sorry Portland, comes back in the midway of the season. He already knows all the guys. He knows what to do. He knows uh, Steve Kerr's system. So he's going to fit right in uh, with the Warriors. And he's going to help perennially on defense in a team that's absolutely atrocious on defense, especially on the road. So hopefully with his skill set, he can bring some road wins and maybe make a push for that five seed if um, Paul George starts lacking for the Clippers and if that injury starts to daunt them. The Warriors are currently on a three-game winning streak, which is very good for them. That's a good sign. They just beat the Philadelphia 76ers last night. I was watching that. Uh, before I went to bed last night. It was a close game all uh, throughout the entire game. Fourth quarter, Warriors took over, and they won that game. So three-game winning streak for the Warriors. And that's not easy, beating a 76ers team that no. is the three seed in the East and looking like Joel Embiid could win MVP. But it was at home, so that's yeah, the reason that's why, they, that's, that's why they won that game for the Warriors because they, they cannot— They blown out if it's in Philly. Exactly. Up next, another possible return. Is LeBron James going to be returning before the playoffs? Per Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN, there's an increasing optimism that Los Angeles Lakers star LeBron James could return to play in a few games in the final week of the regular season. James has been out since suffering a right foot tendon injury on February 26th. So that's today's Saturday, March 25th, so almost a month. It doesn't feel like it's been that long because the Lakers have been doing relatively well. They are 7-3 in their last 10, so they've been staying afloat. So maybe that's why it doesn't feel too long but let's just say the Lakers they just flop and let's just say by the end of the weekend or the beginning of next week to the 11th or 12th seed because that could happen there's only a few game difference do you bring LeBron back if you're out of the plan or do you like okay let's try to win these games let's get into the plan like where's your mind at do you save it for next year or do you try to go right now so I think it really depends um I think it's very fitting you're wearing a Disneyland t-shirt because that's the pinnacle of Disney LeBron World. James Disney yeah World, he has man. Mickey Mouse on his t-shirt that's basically Come LeBron on. James on his shirt um but in the case of the Lakers, they did just move up to the eight seed, so they're in the play-in. But the thing is, is I think they're playing better without LeBron. <laughs> it's very weird to see. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a LeBron. I'm not gonna say hater, but I'm definitely not his biggest fan. But seven and three in the last ten, where LeBron's not playing, do they really need him? Um, I would hold off if they well, start obviously losing you games. Need him. Yeah, but, I mean, I would hold off just a little bit, get them, you know, continuously healthy. And if they stay in that play-in spot, I'd bring them back for the play-in. If they do start falling out, uh, maybe a game behind, I'd bring him back. So I think it really depends on the situation they're in. Um, right now, I think they're at the point where they could just chill out on the run, maybe let hold them rest. back. Yeah, let them rest. And then in that play-in game, you unleash them and see if they can push for a playoff spot. So yeah, I agree with weird spot. I agree with what you're saying, but you're definitely – I don't even. I shouldn't even have to say this. You're a better team when LeBron's on the court. He is the one of the greatest players of all time. I don't what? Know. what? Seven and three in the last ten without him? Yeah, sure. But like, it's LeBron James. Doesn't matter. They're losing games with LeBron James. They were. They I don't were know. I think. I think LeBron they were James. losing more because they were just getting acclimated after the trade deadline. They were bad with Westbrook too. So. I mean, it's, it could be one of those things where the LeBron's out. One of, if not the greatest basketball players of all time, that they have to just perform better. Like Austin Reeves is putting up 25 points, yeah. 11 assists. Who, who expected that? Austin Reeves, he actually has the highest true shooting percentage in NBA history. Which who, is crazy. Exa- who was expecting that? No one. So they're stepping up their game. That is why they're doing so well. I don't think it has anything to do with LeBron James. I think it's as... As Stephen A. Smith would say, it's blasphemy to even bring an yeah. argument up about how they're better without him because it's LeBron James. I don't. Nothing else has to be said on that standpoint. One more little piece of news here on, like, the, you know, these news types of things. Nick Richards gets paid. Big who are you exactly? Who is that? I know who it is, but if you're just not a huge NBA fan, it is a center for the Charlotte Hornets. He agrees on a three-year extension worth up to $15 million with the Charlotte Hornets. I like this signing for the Hornets. They are a young team. Nick Richards is not super young. He's, like, in his mid-20s, but he definitely fits this timeline for the Hornets, and it's a very cheap contract. Yeah. $15 million over three years. It doesn't really get much better for that when you're the Hornets with a valuable center under contract. So not too much on that standpoint. If you have anything to add, please do. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a cheap contract. And I think it's really good um, if they don't end up with Webanyama. You're still going to have Mark Williams and Nick Richards as your big men. So I think locking them up for three years, it's a great sign. Exactly. And that's a very movable contract if they try to 
decide to trade him at the deadline yeah. next year or whenever it may be. It's not that hard to move, and a team will eat that contract up and would love to have him. But, Jamie, you have some Mavericks controversy to talk about. This has been happening over the past few days. What's going on with Mark Cuban and the Dallas Mavericks? So, uh, three days ago, the Dallas Mavericks went head-to-head with the Golden State Warriors in Dallas, so an away game for the Warriors in which they should have won. But controversy ensued. Uh, the Golden State Warriors ended up pulling out a two-point victory at the end of the game, but not without a lot of heat from Mavs owner Mark Cuban, who is now disputing the the loss. So in a report from uh, Shams Charania, he says, the Dallas Mavericks plan to file to the NBA's formal protest of their 127-125 loss to the Golden State Warriors, with focus on alleged referee mistake that led to two free throws uh, for the Warriors late in the third quarter, source tells the Athletic in the stadium. So in a two-point loss where the Warriors were actually given mistaken free throws, and uh, also they were given, they were actually given free points in that game because um, the referees told the Warriors that they had the inbound. Um, so it, it's really weird to talk about because it's kind of confusing the way it happened. So the Dallas Mavericks called a timeout. They thought they had the ball on the inbound, and they started on the opposite side of the, side of the court where the referees went over to Golden State. No, they were reviewing a call that happened. They told Golden State that they were going to get the ball. Dallas, understandably, thought they had the ball. The referees never told Dallas that um, the call that they were reviewing had been overturned. So the Warriors get the ball in the inbound, score a free bucket. And the Mavericks and were never told. it shouldn't have even been their ball. shouldn't have even been their ball. And then, now they're disputing those free throws. And a two-point loss, you can't have that. So, obviously, they're going to be mad about that loss. But not just that. Uh, last night, the Mavericks went head-to-head with the Hornets, who... And guess who won that game? Yeah. <laughs> Hornets were sitting at 23 wins, the Mavericks at 36. And the, Hor- the Hornets were expected to lose by a good amount. The Mavericks were the heavy favorites. Uh, no LaMelo ball. Gordon Hayward was their only player of note for that team. No Terry Rozier. And the Hornets end up beating them 117 to 109 with uh, De- sorry Dennis Smith Jr. hitting the game sealer um, in the biggest upset of this season, uh, categorized by Shams and Woj. So um, shout out Gordon Hayward, 25 points. PJ hey. Washington at 28. Nick Richards, who just got signed, had right. 10 points, 11 rebounds, and then Dennis Smith Jr. had 13, 9 and 5 in 30 minutes. So um, shout overall out. game for them. Yeah. Great game. Even despite Luka having 34-10 and 10 and Kyrie almost having a triple-double as well, the Hornets pulled out a big victory without two of their star players in a massive upset over the Dallas Mavericks, who are still in the playoffs. So and that's uh, a, if you're a Mavericks fan, I'd be depressed. And that's a prime example of when people are like, oh, they should send these teams, these really bad teams like the Pistons, Hornets, Rockets, Spurs to the G League, or college teams will beat them, whatever. The yeah. craziness is said. They just beat up on a good team. Any NBA team can beat any team on any given night, no matter their record. Like, the Magic beat the Celtics, Sixers. They beat all these good teams. Mm-hmm. Granted, the Magic are doing pretty well for themselves this year compared to other years. They have 31 wins. So with all that said, any team can beat any team any given night. That's why I love the NBA. And we don't usually talk about specific games too much, but I was watching. I do this pretty much every morning. I watch NBA highlights. Yesterday, I had a little bit more time on my hands, so I watched the entire fourth quarter. I rewatched it of the Cavs at Nets from Thursday night. And I kind of want to get into the last four minutes of this game. It was just so interesting to me. Isaiah Coro eventually hit the game-winning shot, which I'll lead up to that. But just that, what led up to this is just kind of funny because it shows how bad the Nets are recently. And we were talking about the Nets earlier in this podcast. And then also how good the Cavaliers are defensively and also offensively. And I don't think I've ever looked into a game so in-depth. So I'm sorry if this is really nerdy, but I was very interested in this. So it's back and forth most of the game. But like I said, let's get into the fourth quarter. The Nets jump out to a bit of a lead. Royce O'Neal hits a big three, gives the Nets a 112-104 lead. They're up by eight points with 2.10 left in the game. You know, for most good teams, Jamie, right, if you're up by eight points with about two minutes left, it's not sealed, but I feel like you're pretty content with that lead and most likely you're going to win that game. Well, the Nets, they're not right now a very good team. Levert gets fouled, driving to the hoop by Claxton, makes both the free throws. It's 112-106 now, around 150 left. All right, coming down the other end of the court, Spencer Dinwiddie shoots a mid-range shot over Evan Mobley at 134 left in the game. First, why are you shooting a mid-range shot? over one of the premier defenders in the league with Evan Mobley, who also, coming out of college, everyone knows he is a fantastic perimeter defender for a big man. Mm -hmm. This is not some 
Rudy Gobert, who can guard the paint better than anyone else but can't guard the perimeter. He, Evan Mobley can do it all defensively, so I don't know why you're taking that shot if you're Spencer Dinwiddie. Anyways, he clanks that, of course, just like I said, because you have a great defender on you. Bridges was wide open to his left. I don't know why he didn't pass it to him. Like I said, missed the shot. Luckily, the Nets get the rebound. They use some more clock, bring it down to 122 left in the game. Bridges drives on Mobley. A little smarter of a move. He goes under the basket, and without even looking. See, this is just where I'm trying to get with this. The Nets had three turnovers in the last two minutes of this game. They choked this game entirely. Without even looking, he passes the ball, try, tries to pass it to Dinwiddie, shanks the pass. It gets stolen by Karis LeVert, takes it all the way down to the court for a layup, 112-108 now. Four-point lead. They just lost four points in the matter of less than a minute. Dinwiddie comes back down the other side of the court. He's holding the ball for around until 55 seconds, and he drives on Jared Allen. These, these choices by Spencer Dinwiddie, you're going to drive on Jared Allen, who's one of the best shot blockers in the league, and then he sees Evan Mobley on help defense coming to get him. He leaves Claxton, again, another defender. He tries to pass it to Claxton, who was wide open. It was a smart pass, but he airmails it over his head, turns it over into Darius Garland's hands. Just like that, the pass two times down the court, they turn it over. The Cavs are faster and more explosive getting to the rim. Garland pushes the tempo like they did the entire end of this game. The, the Cavs' tempo, it, it's just insane. They're one of the fastest teams in the entire league. Dishes it to Donovan Mitchell, who explodes to the rim for a tough contested layup. Of course, he's not going to miss that. He hits every clutch shot. 45 seconds left in this ball game. It is 112-110 Nets. You with me? Yep. All righty. It's Nets ball. Bring down the clock to 31 seconds. Dinwiddie, he tries to do too much in the end of this game. He drives to the hoop. I will give him a credit. He makes an almost lob-like layup over Evan Mobley because I think he learned the first time I can't shoot on him because he'll you know, do something or I can't drive around him. He's too big. So he kind of just floats it over his, his reach. Luckily, he makes that in. 114-110 nets now. Now, Jamie, if you're up by four with 30 seconds left, you'd probably feel pretty safe because yeah. you'll get the foul and make the free throws, probably make it a six-point lead, right? You feel, you, feel, you feel pretty safe about that. Cavs call a timeout. Ball moves up the court. Cavs inbound the ball to Donovan Mitchell. He's guarded by Claxton. He drives, step back, in his mouth, 114-112 net. So they're still holding a two-point lead. We're almost done here, guys. I just thought this was so interesting. and just yeah, I just love basketball, so I just want to nerd out for a minute. There's 23 seconds left on the clock, so the Cavs are... The Cavs have to foul or trap because obviously you have a 24-second shot clock. That doesn't matter anymore, so the clock can just run out to zero if the Nets wanted to. Obviously, the Cavs aren't going to do that, so they decide to trap. They're smart enough. They're not going to foul. They trap, and it just works flawlessly. They pass the ball around. It gets into Doran Finney-Smith's hands. He just decides to backhand it, try to pass it to Miles Bridges. Miles Bridges. Mikel Bridges. I wish Miles Bridges was in the NBA because even he's so fun to watch, but he's not. Hopefully next year. Anyways, to Mikel Bridges. Of course, that gets stolen, right? That's their third t- turnover in the last two minutes. Mitchell gets fouled, driving down the court. He goes to the line, makes the first one, but misses the second one. And this is where, hopefully, you guys were on social media and saw this highlight. He misses the second one, grabs his own rebound, goes back up with it, misses it again. The ball is flying around the court. Finally, Karis LeVert for the Cavaliers grabs the ball. He drives to the right around the three-point line, tosses it across the court to Isaac Okoro, wide open for the game-winning three, and Cleveland wins this game 116-114. And that is why the Nets move to a five-game losing streak. And that was a lot, but I just wanted to display how comical and how bad that was for the Brooklyn Nets. No matter who's on that team, I know Kyrie, KD are all gone. You still have plenty of great talent on this roster. Jamie, I know that was a mouthful I just went into, but I just wanted to dissect one of the craziest losses I have seen in a long time. It was almost like Tracy McGrady's 13-point comeback mm-hmm. on the when he was on the Rockets. So I think in this situation, this is where you miss Ben Simmons. A lot of costly turnovers in the end of, uh, at the end of the game where Ben Simmons... You know, despite not being the greatest player in the world, he's very composed in the clutch. He knows what he's doing when he's passing the rock. So having him as your playmaker in that situation, somebody who's 6'10", somebody who can actually probably drive over Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, get a board over. Very good point. Would have been much better for Brooklyn. So, you know, as much as, you know, as much hate Ben Simmons get gets, this would have been beneficial for him to play against that Cleveland team, and maybe they pull out a win. Maybe they do. Thank you very much for letting me nerd out for a few minutes there. I just was watching this whole fourth quarter, especially the last few minutes, and I'm like, 
what is going on? Because I saw Isaac Okor out the game-winning shot. I just wanted to know how it got there. And I was not expecting Brooklyn to be up by eight points with two minutes yeah. left, and that's how they won that ball game. But anyways, let's get into the main segment for today. Our power rankings from 15 all the way down to 1. Let's get it started. You know, we'll change it up. Usually it goes Nick, myself, and then you, Jamie. But let's start off with you, Jamie. Sweet. We'll sweep because you always got to go last. Yeah. I'll go last today. Let's start it off with Jamie. Yeah, I'm sitting in Nick's seat today, so I think it's only fitting. So uh, last episode I left off at number 16 being Toronto. So now let's move to number 15 where I have the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, right now they're sitting pretty. They have lost a few important games, especially the, the Clippers, who have had their number. Um, as of late, they did beat the Clippers uh, a few days ago, lost to them recently, and uh, I do think they're in a great spot for that play in. Um, I think they have a fantastic chance of making the playoffs, um, but they're going to need to get good at the right time. They're, say, they're still a very young and inexperienced team. SGA obviously is their number one guy, averaging 30 plus points a game, but the rest of your guys, they're young. You know, Jalen Williams, the rookie of the year candidate, he's, you know, Still a rookie. Um, who's the oldest player on that team? Is it SGA? No, it's uh, it's probably Justin Jackson. Yeah, and he doesn't play. He doesn't uh, play. No. No. So it's a very young team. Um, well, the youngest team, one of the youngest teams in NBA history. I, yeah. I tweeted about this a few days ago. I believe their average age is 22 it's and crazy. a half. It's something in the 22, 23s. So the reason I don't have them higher, despite them winning games, is because of that young age. I don't think um, they win a playing game. Uh, if it's against somebody like Golden State or somebody against L.A., I don't think they win that. And even if they do win that and make the playoffs, they most likely get swept. Just because they're so young, they don't have that playoff um, playoff leader like they did with Chris Paul a couple of years ago. So number 15, OKC, which is a lot better than a lot of people thought they would be at the beginning of the year. Getting into my 15, I have to halt for a second because I want to switch something. At 15, I have the Brooklyn Nets, <clears throat> but after the whole rant I just went on and they're on a five-game losing streak, I would like to switch something up. So last on our last podcast, I had the Lakers at 17 and the Jazz at 16. I am going to be putting the Brooklyn Nets at 17, keeping the Jazz at 16, but I'll be moving the Los Angeles Lakers into the 15th spot. I don't know if I'm breaking the rules here, but the good thing about running our own podcast is I believe we can make our own rules. So I am going to put the Los Angeles Lakers at the 15th spot. I think that it's well warranted. They're on a three-game winning streak. They're 7-3 and three in their last 10 versus the Brooklyn Nets, who have lost five in a row. And they're just kind of falling apart a little bit. Like we talked about the Ben Simmons issue going on. He's going to be missing a lot of time now. And they're 4-6 of their last 10. Their records are pretty similar. Lakers are 37-37. and 37. The Nets are... 39 and 34. So record-wise, the Nets are a little bit better, but that's because they had KD and Kyrie for a majority in the season, and they gathered a lot of wins. But with that said, I'll clarify: Lakers at 15, Jazz stay at 16, and the Nets are going to be going up to 17, and they will continue to fall back if they continue to play lackluster. But that is who I have at 15. Yep. So my number 14 spot, this is where I'm going to put Brooklyn. I did have them higher before this whole shenanigans where they just start losing, you know, important games. Um, a very young team. They do have 39 wins, but it's not amounting to anything. Um, the, a couple of teams I have ahead of them don't have that many wins, but they're just losing too many games right now. They, they lose Ben Simmons. They just don't know what they're doing in the clutch. And a lot like uh, OKC, they're a pretty young squad. They lose KD and Kyrie, who were their vets, their number one guys. And now you, I'm going to say downgrade to guys like Spencer Dinwiddie, Cam Thomas, um, all these younger guys, Nick Claxton, who's just broken out. And um, despite them being in a playoff spot, playing spot, um, I thought they were going to be fantastic at the beginning of the year. But they have a lot more to do, a lot more talent to get, and a lot more chemistry to keep making. So uh, I'm going to have them at that 14 spot, but I could definitely see them moving back. At my 14 spot, that's where I have the Dallas Mavericks. They're on a three-game losing streak. They just lost, like Jamie discussed earlier, a big one to the Hornets last night. You cannot be losing to the Hornets when you're trying to be a playoff championship contending team. They're 36-38 and currently. The 11th seed out west, they're 
scratching the plan. They're right outside of it. They're actually tied with the Thunder, but the Thunder have the tiebreaker win. And the Pelicans. Uh, no, the Pelicans have one less loss. But but yeah, the Thunder and Mavericks are tied. The Thunder have the tiebreaker in head-to-head games. It's just really hard. I mean, they're definitely a good team, no matter what their record says. That's why they're still in my top 15. With Ky- you know, When you have Luka, Kyrie, Christian Wood, and some you know solid guys like Reggie Bullock around them, Tim Hardaway Jr., you're going to be good. You're going to be pretty good in power rankings. I just can't put them higher, especially where they are right now. If they can get back into the plan, they'll probably move into my top 11, 10. But for right now, I have to put them at 14. All right, so yeah, for uh, my 13, I also have the Dallas Mavericks, who after making this Kyrie Irving trade, I thought were going to be absolutely fantastic, but they are just crumbling as of late. Couldn't beat Golden State at home, which should be an easy task. They can't do it, despite, yes, controversy that I stated earlier. But they just lost to the Hornets in what should have been the easiest game of the year. Legit, all they had to face was Gordon Hayward, and they lose by eight points. You can't be doing that, especially with the playoffs just right around the corner, and you guys plan on making the championship with your two superstars. Right now, it's looking like it's not going to happen. Um, so Dallas, they're in a very tough spot. I'm going to have them at that 13. If they would have beat the Hornets yesterday, I might have had them a spot higher. But they are just not looking coordinated enough for the playoffs yet. So I'm going to have them sitting pretty at that 13. At 13 for me, that's where I put the Oklahoma City Thunder, my second favorite team. I love seeing them bla- back in playoff conversations. I have missed the Russell Westbrook days, but SGA has taken over with his swagger and is also very much into fashion as well. I don't know what it is with OKC point guards and their fashion statements, but I love it, SGA. Keep doing your thing, man. He is my favorite player in the NBA. Him and Jalen Brown, they get the job done for me. Watching them every night is so much fun. But as the team... As for the team, I should say, they are currently the 10th seed in the Western Conference, 36 and 38. They are on a two-game losing streak, but they're six and four in their last 10 games. So they, they've been doing so well for the Thunder, for what they are, the youngest team in the NBA, like me and Jamie just discussed a few minutes ago. No one expected them to do this. They have Jalen Williams, the one with the little hair piece over his face. That Jalen Williams. The other Jalen Williams is doing well for himself too as a rookie. But the one I'm talking about, the one with the little hair thing over his face, he has been such a breakout player. No one expected him to do this his rookie year. No one really saw that coming. And then you have SGA, who in my mind should be the most improved player in the NBA and also should be an MVP conversation. He should not win it, but he should definitely be in top five in MVP conversations just because of if they didn't have SGA, they would easily be the 15th, 14th seed mm. in the Western Conference. Again... It is just amazing seeing what the Thunder are doing. And they have all these picks. And Chet Holmgren, their first pick in this year's draft, didn't play this entire season. Hopefully he comes back next year and can prove himself to be a star in this league. But what they're doing without even getting really in deep into their draft picks, because they have draft picks all the way until guys who are in eighth grade right now, Mm -hmm. it's just great to see this for the Thunder. They are back in playoff conversations, and I have them at 13, and I hope they continue to build, and I love the the direction they're heading. Yeah, so uh, at that number 12 spot, this is where I'm going to have the Golden State Warriors. Um, They have been fantastic at home. Absolutely unbeatable. Wow. I had the Warriors last podcast. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I did. Um, I do think that's a little criminal where you had them because Golden State is the reigning champions. They've been unbeatable at home. However, I can't put them up in the top ten where they would have been last year just because of that atrocious away record. They have been appalling on the road. I'm not even sure what it is about it. They're just straight up bad. Is it coaching? Is it players? Are they scared? I don't even know. Start with the punch. (laughs) However, they have won two of their last road games. However, I mean, it was against the Rockets and the Mavericks. Um... The Rockets shouldn't have been that hard. Yeah, it's the Rockets, whatever. One of, I think, the worst record in the league outside of the Pistons and the Spurs. And then they beat the Mavericks in what we already talked about, all that controversy in a game that maybe they shouldn't have won. So I'm going to have them at that 12 spot. They're still dominant. They're sitting at 39 wins. And I, they're the Golden State Warriors. Come playoff time, they're going to be dominant, and they can make another championship run. Who knows? At my number 12 spot, that's where I put the Chicago Bulls. I did wow. not expect them this high up, but listen to me here. They are 6-4 and four in their last 10, 35-38. and 38. They are the 10th seed in the Eastern Conference, so they're in the play-in, and they have a pretty comfortable lead. After the Celtics beat the Pacers last night, that made the Pacers fall back a little bit to 33-41, and 41. so the Bulls are living pretty comfortable right now, especially with only a week and a half left in the regular season. With that said, Zach Levine is averaging 29 points in the last 10 games so far this season. 
along with five assists and four rebounds. Beginning of the season, he was kind of like just not the same old Zach Levine. Zach Levine, when he's on, he is one of the best scorers in the NBA. He makes it look easy, kind of like a Bradley Beal type of level. But in the last 10 games, he scored 27 points, 42 points, 29 points, 36, 25, 39. It goes on and on to, to average out 29.1 points per game. And it's leading to wins for the Chicago Bulls. Like I said, 6-4 and four in their last 10 Again, they start off the season terribly, so they're 35 and 38. But if they can continue to build upon with Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan, Vucevic, who I know you don't like, but I personally do, mm-hmm. this team could be a team to get out of the play-in and then give that one two-seed a run for their money in the first round. They yeah. definitely won't beat the Celtics, who are currently the two-seed, or the Bucks, who are currently the one-seed. But I think the Bulls could give a run for money just because of the— <laughs> Bless you, Jamie. You. Just because of the amount of star power the Bulls have, Zach Levine, DeMar, Vucevic, mm-hmm. and then good role players around them, I think they could give the first and second seed a run for their money. So for that I reason, know. I have met 12. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So at my 11th spot, this is where I'm going to put the Heat of Miami. They have been just good consistently ever since bringing in Jimmy Butler. Um, They had that finals appearance in 2020, and they've just been fantastic ever since. Um, They continue on that path. They just hit their 40th win of the season. They are sitting at the – where are they? They are the 16th in the East, sitting at 40 and 34. So one more win than the Golden State Warriors right behind them, and I think they're going to be great come playoff time. It's Jimmy Buckets, Bam Adebayo. They, they, they always perform in the playoffs. I think they're going to be they're going to be set. They're going to be good, and who knows? Maybe they'll make another crazy finals appearance like they did in 2020. I doubt it, obviously, but who knows? Jimmy Butler always pulls something out of his hat, so it, it'll be great to see. My 11th spot for the power rankings is the fifth seed in the Western Conference, that being the Phoenix Suns. Wow. They are 38-35, and 35, and here's why I have them. You say, you, we say, wow, isn't this as high or low? For Phoenix, I think it's a little low. A little low? Okay. So I guess my argument, you would agree with it. Kevin Durant is coming back. That's a very powerful thing for them. Yeah. And then Devin Booker. He is averaging 33.5 points in the last 10 games. He is... And a, a good amount of those are 40-point games, and he is doing amazing for the Phoenix Suns right now. He was not an all-star this year. I don't think he played like one yeah, most he, of the season. He was hurt a lot. He was hurt a lot, didn't really play like one he a lot of the season. He last night against Sacramento. Yeah, yeah, good game for him. But in the last 10 games, he has been playing that all-star level. And yesterday, because I got the snap memory because I was fortunate enough to attend this game, I believe it was the fifth or sixth year anniversary of his 70-point game against my Boston Celtics. With that said, this time of the year is Devin Booker's year. He scored 70 points five or six years ago. So this is his time in the season where he just pops off and just knocks down points after points, averaging 33.5 in the last 10 games. And it's, it's amounting to... Not many wins. They've lost their last three, four and six in their last ten. But they don't, I mean, bring back Kevin Durant yeah. with Chris Paul, Aiton, and Booker. Gross. That 4-5 matchup with the Clippers' Suns, I would. I hope that's what it is for the playoffs. That would be so much fun mm-hmm. to watch. Definitely a six. They're so evenly matched. Exactly. Because they're both kind of a little bit underperforming this season. Yeah. But they're so, like you just said, evenly matched. Yeah, you have, like, Chris Paul and Westbrook, two older guards who are still getting it done. You have Paul George and Devin Booker, two of the best, probably the two best shooting guards in the league. Kawhi and KD, who have always had a rivalry in the NBA. It's just going to be a fantastic match. Zubac versus Aiton. Yeah. A good matchup there. I think the Clippers have more depth, which will make it interesting. Clippers have a little bit more depth, but they both have good role players on both sides. Yeah. I think that's a six or seven. I'm hoping for seven. Seven games will be awesome. Six or seven game series, 100% on that standpoint. So that is why I have the Phoenix Suns at 11. All right, so at my 10 spot, this is where I have the Los Angeles Clippers, who I, you know, just talked about. Um, ever since bringing in Russell Westbrook, it brought them only good things. Um, I know there was some skepticism around bringing him in, but they're sitting at 39 wins. They are five games behind Sacramento, so um, Sacramento's the third seed. So, yeah, it's a pretty decent gap between the three and the four seed, but... It doesn't really matter. They're going to face off against, hopefully, Phoenix in that playoff series. And I think, like we just talked about, that goes to seven games. Uh, Westbrook and Kawhi Leonard have been absolutely dominant. The only thing that is hurting them, though, is Paul George did uh, have that knee injury. He hyperextended it in that game against OKC a few nights ago. So hopefully they have him back for the playoffs. I know they said it would be about two to three weeks. So they are aiming to bring him back in the first round. So that first round, it's going to be a beautiful matchup between him, uh, them and the Suns. 
So I'm very excited to see what the Clippers bring in store. You know, with Russell Westbrook in the playoffs. Let's see what happens. At my 10th spot, I also have the Los Angeles Clippers. Jamie just said it perfectly, but let's talk about it for a minute. Why do you have the Suns higher than the Clippers? Only because I, um, the Suns have finals experience, uh, especially as of late. I mean, Kawhi does, and yeah. West, Westbrook, early, well, very Paul George early. has never been there, and Paul George has notoriously not been the greatest playoff performer, so like looking back at 2020. Um, but then the Suns, who were legit, just came off of uh, finals appearance um, just a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, they were choked it last year. Yeah, they were very close last year, couldn't get it done. But now you bring in Kevin Durant, who is... A top three small forward ever. It's gonna. They're they're loaded. Uh, they do have similar records, and I uh, just think it'll be. Wonderful. I am praying the Warriors do not jump into that fifth or yes. fourth seed because that'd be lame. That'd be a good series too. But just the Suns and Clippers. I just think there's more of a rivalry there. Yeah. Westbrook. I mean, yeah. Westbrook versus Kevin Durant. Oh my gosh. I just. I'm. I'm rooting for that one. I mean, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant wouldn't be bad either. No, obviously, yeah. Former teammates as well. I just think Westbrook. Uh, there's more behind that. More behind that. Curry and KD won two championships together. There's just more behind Westbrook and KD of what could have been or should have been, honestly. Yeah. So I'm excited for that. I don't need to go too in-depth on the Clippers. Jamie did all the talking right there. So, But I also have them at my 10th spot. Yeah. So my 9th spot, they're pretty even with the Clippers. We've already talked about them a good amount today. This is where I have the Phoenix Suns. Oh, we're just a three, three in a row. So. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Phoenix, Alex already talked about them. They're, they're completely set for this Kevin Durant comeback. They're completely set for the seven-game series. They're hopefully about to have against the Clippers. They did just lose to Sacramento, and they haven't been great in their last ten. But obviously they're missing their superstar in KD. So, I mean, I'm very excited for what has to come in the, in the next you know few games. I just hope these two guys can you know keep a winning stretch in the next how, – how many games are there left in the season? There's less than 10. Yeah. Hopefully they could just win out those last few, and we have that playoff series. Um, but the Phoenix, like I said earlier, I have them slightly above Clippers for the reason that they've been in the finals, all their guys have experience, and now they're bringing in Kevin Durant. They're, they're going to be good. At my number nine spot, that's where I put, and I'm surprised to say this, not surprised as of today, but surprised if you asked me earlier in the season, the New York Knicks. They are currently the fifth seed out in the Eastern Conference, 42-33. and 33. They are on a three-game losing streak, but you got Jalen Brunson. You got all these great pieces around him, Julius Randle, R.J. Barrett, who I believe should be playing way better than he is, but he's still playing well. He's still averaging around 20 points per game. I just think he should be averaging 28 points per I thought he was going to be on par with Zion. Hasn't really panned out the way, but he's, he's still playing very well for himself. But with that said, the New York teams, New York teams, New York Knicks, they'd be playing the Cavaliers right now if it was the 4-5 or five matchup. And I, I can confidently say the Knicks could win that series. Yeah. I just think they— that New York atmosphere? That New York atmosphere. I mean, they wouldn't have home court advantage, but I just think they match up so well against the Cavaliers team defensively. <sighs> And offensively, Jalen Brunson yeah. has been a torch for the Knicks this entire season. Same with Julius Randle, but especially Jalen Brunson. No one expected him to pop off like he has been. He's averaging 24 points per game in the last 10 games of this season so far. Every single night, he's carrying this. Not carrying, that's not the right word. But he is just making clutch buckets for this New York Knicks team. And the thing is, he was doing this in Dallas, too. Mm-hmm. It's just it wasn't really getting on highlight reels because he was obviously overshadowed by Luka Doncic making more clutch buckets than him. But I'm so glad to see Jalen Brunson on a team where he can flourish and be a true number one option on a team. And this is New York basketball. I love to see it for the Knicks. And I definitely think they can make a little bit of a run in the playoffs. It won't be easy against the Cavs, but I think if there's a team to do it out of these, you know, possible five seeds that can play the Cavs because the Cavs have that four seed locked up unless the Sixers mm-hmm. just fall back. But with that said, I got the Knicks at nine, and I'm excited to see what they do going into the playoffs. I mean, just like Alex said, at the eight, I have also the New York Knicks, <laughs> who I think are just going to be great um, in these next few games. Uh, Brunson, Barrett, uh, Julius Randle, and then Josh Hart has been a major addition defensively. Right, I completely forgot about Josh he's Hart. Been, yeah. He's been amazing for New York. They just have They've rarely lost games since bringing him in. So that matchup with Cleveland, it's going to be great. The New York Knicks have been sensational. Um, they've lost really only to good teams since the All-Star breaking and bringing Josh Hart in. They won eight games in a row when they yeah. traded for Josh Hart. Like I just said, they're currently, they've are currently they lost three in a row, but yeah. they were doing so well. They lost to the Hornets, didn't they? they that, didn't the Hornets break the streak? 
Yeah, they did lose the Hornets. And then they lost to Sacramento the next game. So, um, despite that, New York has been fantastic. And I feel good for those fans up there. They've been... um, They've been treated with nothing but depression for a very long time. So hopefully, Spike some, Lee. Yeah, Spike Lee. Uh, Trey Young has been a big part of that. So hopefully, the, uh, those fans up in New York can finally be treated to something nice. At my number eight spot, this is where I put the Miami Heat. Okay. They started off this season underperforming. They're still underperforming. I thought they'd be a top three, four seed in the Eastern Conference. They're currently 40 and 34, sitting pretty at that sixth spot, but they could switch with the Brooklyn Nets if the Brooklyn Nets decide to break their losing streak. Most likely won't catch the fifth seed. They could catch the Knicks, who have two more wins. I'd say the four to one seed's locked up, but with the Heat, they're on a two-game winning streak, and they're seven and three in their last ten. They have definitely turned around this season for themselves heading into the playoffs, which is a great thing to see. As a Celtics fan, scared, but outside of my Celtics fandom, when we're just talking NBA like right now, I love to see the Miami Heat catching fire towards the end of the season going into the playoffs. Because like Jamie said, you never know what Jimmy Butler might do. You also got torches like Tyler Hero. Kyle Lowry is getting old, underperforming, but he is still a great defensive body out there on the court. Bam Adebayo is having his best season of his career, in my opinion. I'm so excited to see this Heat team really start to catch their flames heading into the playoffs. Like I said, 7-3 and three in their last 10, two-game winning streak, and this is what the Heat need going into the playoffs. Very well said. So, at my number seven spot, this could be a little controversial. I don't know. I have the Memphis Grizzlies. Ooh, that's low. Yeah, it may be a little low, but... Um, wow, that's very low. They are probably the best defensive team in the NBA. They just got John Morant back, and they're the second seed in the West. However, I don't think they're that much better than the third seed, um, which I'll, I'll get into later. Um, but Memphis, they've been just straight up balling the entire season. But they have been hit with a lot of controversy over the last little bit, especially guys with guys like John Morant Dylan and Brooks. Mr. Mr. Villain himself, Dylan Brooks. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> he's not that good. He thinks he's Draymond Green. He, 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 he really wants to be Draymond Green, and he's not. He was never as good as Draymond Green in his prime. Um, it's always against the Warriors, too. Yeah, I don't know what his problem is. Uh, they lost to the Warriors after talking all that smack last year. Um, so I just think with all that controversy, it's going to surround Memphis – come crunch time, come a playoff series, and I think it's going to hurt them. Um, Dylan Brooks, he's going to get exposed for his trash talking. Um, I don't think he's going to have what it takes to back it up. John Morant, um, he's never really played amazing in the playoffs. They lost to Golden State in that series, and so I just don't see if – I don't know if they have what it takes. Just to back up all that smack they talk, um, it's going to be a tough one for Memphis. They are sitting at, what are they at? They're at 46 wins, 46 and 27, three games back from the one seed. They have been great at home, 30 and 6 at home, but 19 and 18 away. So um, they're going to have home court advantage. They'll be fine, but I just don't see with all of that trash they talk, it's going to be tough to back that up. At my number seven spot in Jamie, you might not like this one, but it's not coming from a place of hatred. I just think the team's above them. Just hold a little more power in these power rankings. I got your Sacramento Kings. They're the third seed in the West, so I'm, tr- I'm really not taking anything away from them. They are 44 and 29 currently. They could win 50 games. Mm-hmm. They almost basically have to win out, which I don't think they will. But with that said, they still have their most wins since when? Like the early 2000s? Yeah, I think it was 2004, 2003. Yeah, so I mean, you know, no matter how this season goes, you guys get first round exit, which I don't think you will. First round exit, whatever it is, this is a successful season and a year to build upon looking into your championship contending future. But with that being said, De'Aaron Fox is the man, averaging 25 points per game. Then he gets a bonus grabbing the boards, almost averaging 13 rebounds a game. And then he gets a bonus who's basically like a point guard, averaging seven assists a game. I compare to Sabonis to a Nikola Jokic, but just not as good overall. If Jokic, I mean, if if Sabonis became a Jokic, he, I think, I don't know where I'm trying to go with that. My point being <laughs> is Sabonis is a mini Jokic. That's what I'm trying to he, say. He's number six in MVP rankings, and he had 27-9-9 nine last night. Exactly. My point being is Sabonis is a mini Jokic, just not as good. That's where I was heading with my statement there. I just kind of confuddled my words. But the Kings, again, I'm not trying to take anything away from them. I just think the six teams up uh, I have above them are just a little bit more powerful in the power rankings. But the Kings are 7-3 and three in their last 10. They won last night. I'm excited to see where they go heading into the playoffs. Uh, I just want to retract my statement about Memphis. 
I said they were a, uh, I said they were 19 and 18 away. I was actually looking at Denver. Memphis is actually 14 and 22 away. Even worse. Yeah, so they're amongst some of the worst in the NBA. Could be up there with Golden State in terms of away games. So I'm um, surprised Nuggets are only 19 and 18. Yeah, that's a little weird. That's how you know they're fake. That's why I have Sacramento above Memphis because Sacramento's 22 and 14 away, completely opposite. But I'm not even talking about Sacramento right now because at the five or at the six seed, I have the Cleveland Cavaliers, who are the third seed in the no, they're not. They're the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference. But that's not to say they don't. They aren't racking up wins. 47 and 28. And they have been sensational everywhere they go. They're twenty six and eleven at home, twenty three and thirteen away. So it doesn't matter where they're playing; they're gonna they're gonna ball out. We saw the resiliency they have against the Nets. Just what was it last night? Uh, that Nets game or was it two nights? It ago? was Thursday night. Yeah. So they have a lot of resiliency. They're completely stacked all the way from A down to Z. They're gonna be great come playoff time. It just comes down to experience. Evan Mobley, it's only his second second year in the league. Uh, Jared Allen, he's cool. Donovan Mitchell, he's got experience. Darius Garland doesn't have playoff experience necessarily. Neither do these guys like Isaac Okoro. Karis LeVert doesn't have a ton. So it's going to be fun to see what they have in store. Um, Cleveland, I think they're really good. But there's a lot of teams in the East that they have to face against. So I think that's really the main reason why I don't have them above a team like Sacramento is because the East is so loaded. I just don't know if they can get that far, especially against New York, who I think is very slept on. Um, and even if they do beat New York, they still have you know teams like Boston ahead of them. They have teams like the Sixers and the Bucks ahead of them. So I just don't know if they can make that insane push. Extremely well said there, Jamie. But at my sixth spot, that's where I have the Denver Nuggets. Wow. Yeah. They are the wow. number one seed out west in the Western Conference. But I have them at six in my power rankings. They're 49 and 24. Four, and they are a home win monster. Thirty and six at home, nineteen and eighteen on the road, five and five in their last ten, and they have won their last two games. But this is why I have them at the sixth seed, and maybe not a little higher for being the one seed out west. I just think the teams above them are a more real team, and I mean that in the way of I think the neg- the Nuggets could lose in the first round of the playoffs. Yeah. The other teams, I don't think they will. The Nuggets have proven in their entire time as the team they have now with Mike Malone, they can't get to the finals. They've been the number one seed multiple times going into the playoffs. They lose in the semi conference semifinals or the conference finals. They have never achieved that going over that hump of getting to the NBA finals. They've been beaten by Donovan Mitchell when he was on the Jazz multiple times. They have never done it. Could this be the year? Maybe but I don't know until it happens. So for that reason, the teams above them, I just think they have a better chance of going deeper into the playoffs. I think they have real, like, realer talent to help them push that. I just don't – the Nuggets, they just I, – I don't know. I'm not a huge Nuggets guy. I think – I love Jokic. Are some of his things stats a little fake? Sure. But he is so good. Jamal Murray's great. I just – I don't see him as good as the teams above them, no matter what the record says. All right, so at my five spot, this is where I'm going to have my hometown favorite team, Sacramento Kings. Um, I had them in our very first power ranking, I think at like 15, and everybody thought I was blasphemous for saying that. Um, oh, the Kings are going to be so mid, you're overhyping them. Back in uh, December. Yeah, it was a long time ago. And shoot, I was sleeping on them. Now they're the fifth in my power rankings. They were what, six for you, seven? Seven. That's still yeah, astronomical seven. for what I thought. I thought they were going to be like maybe the sixth seed in the West. Not not even the sixth seed. I think I had them as a play-in team. But now they've locked in a, play, a playoff spot. They're third in the West at 44 and 29. They're 22 and 14 away, 22 and 15 at home. Um, and they have the best record in the NBA since the All-Star break. So they've just been phenomenal everywhere they've been. They have, I think at this point, the highest offensive rating for a team ever, which is crazy to say. It's the Sacramento Kings, and people don't really look at us that way. People still think, oh, it's the same old Kings. This is not the same old Kings. DeMontis Sabonis, like Alex said earlier, he's baby Jokic. Um, he's number six in the MVP rankings. It took me a while to get there, but that was my point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, uh, he's very close to averaging that triple-double, which is very rare to see from a big man. Um, and then you have De'Aaron Fox who has completely, I'm not even going to say broken out, because he's been that guy in Sacramento. Just finally got his respect. He's finally getting his respect. He's um, 
just been dominant. I think he's averaging 25, 6, and 6 over the season. He's been fantastic. And then that bench is what puts in work. Malik Monk, sixth man of the year candidate. Uh, Kevin Herter had 30 points last night, 9 rebounds. Um, and then you have your rookie in Keegan Murray. He's a rookie of the year candidate. So Mike Brown has done a fantastic job in building this team and completely turning them around to be that third seed in the West. And I think they're completely set for a playoff push. I think they're going to be extremely hard to stop at home and away. It's going to be fun to see what they can do. At my number five spot, just like Jamie having his hometown team, I have my hometown wow. team, the Boston Celtics, at my five spot. I'm a little bit disappointed in them right now. I'm a little happier. They're six and four in their last ten. They were four and six in their last ten last week. So that's kind of that's flip flop. They have won their last two games against Jamie's Kings yeah. and the Pacers last night. But they just haven't been doing as well as they started off the season. They've definitely picked that back, picked it back up a little bit in their last 10 games. But the previous 10 games to that, they were losing games they shouldn't have. They were Joe Mazzulla has been calling some really interesting plays in the end of the game. For some reason, when they like to inbound the ball, when they're over half court, they put Jalen Brown in the back court. So he's like 60 feet away from the basket where he should be the guy over half court having the ball. I don't know. They run some really, really interesting odd sets at the end of the game that has cost them games against the Jazz last week and some other teams. Uh, the Timberwolves, I believe, they lost to. But games they shouldn't be losing, especially the Jazz. You can't be losing to the Jazz. Yeah. No matter how solid they have been this season, if you're supposed to be a championship contending team, you can't be losing to the the Jazz. It's just the 35 and 38 Jazz. With that said, let's go back to the Celtics. Jason Tatum is that man, averaging 30 points per game. Nine rebounds, and then you have Marcus Smart, their assist leader, with almost seven assists a night. And then, let's talk about the man Jalen Brown, averaging 27 points per game. Arguably, in my opinion, more efficient than Jason Tatum. Can you make the argument that he's better? Definitely could be made. Definitely could be made. I personally like Jalen Brown better than Jason Tatum, just because he's more efficient, more of a overall... I'm not going to say team player because Jason Tatum has been doing so well passing the rock ever since the All-Star break, but I just think he's overall, he's just, I don't think he's not going to lose us the game like Tatum might, shucking up shots. With that said, we are 27-9 and at home, 24-14 and on the road. Overall, very good season for my Boston Celtics. Been a little slow lately, but they're picking, picking it back up heading into the playoffs, and hopefully they can continue their power into the playoffs and win please win me championship 18 <laughs> yeah. so at number four this is where I have the number one seed in the west the Denver Nuggets um, I considered putting them over Boston I'm just not going to do it um, I'm looking at the numbers and I think Boston just beats them out by a little bit they have a couple more wins and their home and away records are pretty similar so I'm going to put Denver here uh, just because uh, it's tough yeah they're the one seed in the west but they've shown time in and time out that they are just not a playoff team. Um, for some reason, Nikola Jokic just can't lead a team to playoff victories. They're good every single year. It just doesn't amount to anything. That's why I couldn't put them so high. Yeah, and then the year they had uh, Jamal Murray going off in the bubble, averaging 40 a game, they still couldn't get it done. Um, again, yeah, again, yeah. Donovan Mitchell came out on top. Yeah, so it's just been tough for them. They don't know how to get it done. They're great in the regular season. But come playoff time, they crumble. So hopefully they can turn that around. Actually, no, not even hopefully. I want the Kings to beat them. So we'll see if they can turn it around. I'm not so sure if they can just because of their recent history. And I can't put them above these three Eastern Conference teams just by looking at it. So Denver, I think I'm pretty safe putting it four. At my fourth spot, that's where I put the Cleveland Cavaliers. They are currently the fourth seed in the East, 47-28. and 28. The best defensive rating in the entire NBA. A, their defense, like I just Ooh. said, I mentioned it earlier in the show, I was showing you prime examples. They caused, or forced, I should say, they forced three turnovers in the last two minutes of a ball game against the Brooklyn Nets, ultimately aiding in their win. With that said, I think the Cavs are extremely scary, no matter what their seeding is. They could be the sixth seed, and I'd be scared of them as a Celtics fan, a Bucks fan, a Sixers fan, whatever those top teams are Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, Evan Mobley, Jared Allen. Jared Allen and Evan Mobley are both centers, but they have Evan Mobley playing power forward because they want to start both. And they're both about seven feet tall, both relatively lengthy, but built, built dudes that can block your shot. Also make some threes at the other end, more likely Evan Mobley. Both fantastic defenders. Like I mentioned earlier, Evan Mobley can play perimeter defense at almost seven feet tall. That's almost unheard of. It's more common in today's NBA with the young guys coming into the league. But 
but still, he is that new generation of defensive ability centers, and it's it's crazy to see this. I almost put him a little higher, but I just couldn't because the other teams I think just have a little bit of an edge above him, which I'll talk to I'll talk about in a minute. But yeah, I got the Cavs at four seed, even though they're not one of the higher seeds up here. It's just they are well built for a playoff push. All right, so let's move on to the top three. At that three spot is where I have the Boston Celtics. They are sitting fifth. I had them higher than you. That's I great. know. I'm saying I, res- yeah. I respect it. <laughs> so uh, right now they're sitting at 51 and 23, and their home record is phenomenal at 27 and nine. Away they're 24 and 14. Not necessarily as good. That's where their still, losses have been coming. Yeah, probably. still great. Um, it's just the first half of the season they looked straight up unstoppable, unbeatable. Offensively they were unstoppable. Defensively they were fantastic. But that second half of the year has not been as great. They've been losing a lot more games. They were the one seed in the East for a very long time. Right now one seed in the league too. Yeah, and um, they've fallen down to the two right now. They were the three um, behind Philly, but now they've taken that two seed. Um, so they've been fantastic. They have the. They were in the finals just a year ago. They have more experience under their belt, and I think they are completely set to make a playoff push. It's just the two teams I have ahead of them got loaded up. They got better, and it's going to be tough um, to see if they could beat them in a playoff series. At my three spot, this is a team that's on a five-game winning streak, eight and two in their last ten, and they just got John Morant back. Give me the Gre- Memphis Grizzlies at my number three spot. They are perfectly in shape for the playoffs. They are lighting their torch at the perfect moment. 8-2 and two in their last 10. Won 5 out of 5 of their last 5 games. Whew. One week left. A little over a week left in this season. They are perfect. In a perfect spot to almost... They could almost take over that one seed. Maybe they'd probably have to win out to take over that one seed they'd over the Nuggets. Denver would have to lose a few games. Yeah, they definitely would have to win out. Jamie just said it perfectly right there. Denver would have to drop a few. But it's possible. Probably not going to happen. They're probably going to stay put at that 2-3 seed. Maybe the Kings win a few games. With that said, whoever they face in the first round, it's going to be tough. Jaron Jackson Jr. is Defensive Player of the Year candidate. Great depth. Dylan Brooks pissing me off. He, I don't know. Off. I don't know what he's trying to do. Like He's really not that good. He's talking about how he should be like a star or something. How no. He, he has one of the worst shooting farms I've ever seen. I know. And, and his shooting percentage is, is He's so inefficient. He was also, I remember our last podcast, we talked about Jalen Green being one of the top yeah. five most inefficient players. Dylan Brooks was also on that yeah. list, being named one of the top five most inefficient players in the entire NBA. With that said, we can push Dylan Brooks aside. The rest of this Memphis Grizzlies roster is amazing. So well built. And like I just said, Ja Morant has just returned. And they won most of those games recently without Ja Morant. And he's only been back for one of those. Let's see what they can continue to do on the court. I'm excited to see how they do in the playoffs. If they don't make it to the Western Conference Finals, I think that is blasphemy, as Stephen A. Smith would say, and underperforming. Yep. So now let's go to that number two spot. And this is where I'm going to have the Philadelphia 76ers. Ooh, okay. I'm going to have the Philadelphia 76ers. Third in the Eastern Conference at 49-24. and They're 9-1 and in their last 10 games. They have been spectacular. 26-11 and at home, 23-13 and away. So not necessarily the greatest, um, especially comparing them to the to the Bucs and the, the Celtics. But it's still amounting of wins. But the reason I have them uh, above the Celtics, even though they are uh, below them in the ratings, is because you have that MVP in Joel Embiid. He's right now, he's number one in betting odds to win that award, and he probably should have won it last year. So we've seen what he could do, but now you're loaded. You have James Harden, you have Tyrese Maxey, and a lot of depth. The Sixers are going to be terrifying to play in the playoffs. I do not want to see them, especially considering they're nine and one in their last ten. Um, they just look straight up unbeatable. Uh, this should be, it, it's going to be a fun playoff uh, playoff series. Um, just playoffs in general, seeing all these fantastic teams. But despite being nine and one, I don't see them at that one spot yet. There is one team that has all the weapons in the world that I'll get to next. Jumping into mine number two, I have the Milwaukee Bucks. Crazy. They're eight and two in their last ten. They're on a three game winning streak. And don't get me wrong, Drew Holiday. Chris Middleton, Giannis, Brooke yep. Lopez, Grayson Allen, Javon Carter, Joe Ingles, Pat Connington, Jay Crowder, Bobby Porras, Goran Drodrick, Pat Connington, who I, I said him twice, I don't know why, so that Wesley Matthews, 
That is basically our entire entire roster, and all those guys I just named are impactful to the team. Yeah. There's not many teams in the NBA that have, from 1 to 12 to 13, they all can go on the court, and they all can be extremely impactful. And then you have Giannis, who's the best player in the NBA. Chris Middleton is one of the best shooters in the NBA, not having his best season because he was injured for a while, but he's getting back into form. And then you have Drew Holiday, who's arguably is having his best season of his entire career at 32 years old. Yep. I love to see this for the Milwaukee Bucks. Almost sounds like I'm making a case for them to be the best team in the league, but I'm not. I'll get to the Philadelphia 76ers in a minute. But yeah, I have to put them at the two spot. I just think Philly is just doing a little bit better right now heading into the playoffs. I know they just lost last night, but they have someone that is just going off. I'll let you make your case, though, for the Milwaukee Bucks. So yeah, a lot like Alex said, I have the Milwaukee Bucks at number one. They're sitting at 53-20. and 20. Sensational. They are two and a half games above uh, Boston, who are at two, and four games above Philly, who are at three. At home, they're 30 and seven, which is one of the best records in the league. 23 and 13 away, eight and five in their division, and they're eight and two in their last 10. Um, so they have been straight up unbeatable. Their roster from one to 13 is just unmatched. Everybody on that team can go up and put up points, assists, rebounds if needed. But then you have Giannis. Who, uh, who's a former two-time MVP, and a lot of people are saying he should be MVP this year. Like Every comment section I see mentioning Joel Embiid being the number one guy as the MVP, everybody I see is Giannis, 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 Giannis. He should be number one. And I don't think it's ridiculous to say that. Giannis has been straight up the best player in the NBA for a good time now, and I don't see that title being taken away from him anytime soon. They won the NBA Finals just two years ago, Who's to say they can't do it again with a, with a new and improved Drew Holiday? You bring in Jay Crowder. Javon Carter's having the best season of his career. You bring in Joe Ingles. Uh, Chris Middleton, who obviously isn't as good, but it's made up for by a lot of other guys on that team. Just way more depth for them. So the Bucks, I think they have a pretty, a pretty straightforward path to the NBA Finals, and I think they are my title favorite. At my number one spot, no... You know, it's no shock because we were kind of talking about it. I have the Philadelphia 76ers, and here's why. Joel Embiid has been amazing all year, but he has become not only the best center in the NBA, but I believe right now, and this could change by next week depending on what happens, but right now he is playing as the best player in the entire NBA, carrying, not carrying, the Sixers have a well-built roster too like the Bucks, but he is outperforming everyone else on his team by a mile. They are 8-2 and two in their last 10, 49-24 and 24 in the Eastern Conference. They're only a few games behind the Celtics and then a few games behind the Bucks. They'll probably stay at that 3-2 spot. But with that said, Joel Embiid is averaging 35 points per game, 10 rebounds, 5 assists in the last 10 games of this season, and his blocks, steals, everything, just his entire game is just flawless. Granted, you could say he gets to the line a lot, I don't care. He is get putting up points, which is equaling to wins for this Philadelphia 76ers team. 33 on the season, 10 rebounds on the season, 4 assists on the season. I, I just think Joel Embiid right now is the best player in the NBA. Is that a wild take? Not, not really. I think it's really up to him and Giannis. I think Jokic is... I, I'm gonna say he's a decent. There's a decent gap between those two and Jokic. Where I know a lot of people will say, "Oh, he's the greatest offensive, one of the greatest offensive players of all time." I don't see it. I think Giannis and um, Giannis and Embiid just do a lot more all over the court just than he does. Watching Joel Embiid. And don't get me wrong, Jokic does the same thing. He's just a little smaller mm-hmm. and not, especially after losing a lot of weight. Joel Embiid's footwork at the size he is, at the weight he is, it's like watching Michelangelo make a painting. It is just. Artwork. He is so big, but so fast, so dominant in the paint, anywhere on the court. It's just flawless watching him on, just do everything he does on the court from obviously his premier scoring, rebound, to passing. And then you have James Harden averaging almost 22 points per game, six assists, and averaging, I mean, six rebounds and 10 assists. He has completely turned his game around from being a Joel Embiid where it's score first, I'm going to take over this game. He averaged, what, 35 points per game when he won MVP back five, six years ago? To now revamping his career at an older age, people are like, oh, James Harden's kind of fallen off a little bit. He's getting old when he was in Brooklyn and his last year on uh, on the Rockets where he just kind of didn't want to be there. To now, he is a pass-first 
past first guard. Did you ever think James Harden would be a fa- past not, not, first guard? Like, no. I think five years ago when everybody saw what he was doing in Houston, putting up like 36 points a game, nobody thought he'd be a past first guy. And now look at him. It's crazy. It, it's insane. So this Philadelphia 76ers team is just so well built. And then you have Tyrese Maxey, who has had a breakout season especially in the first half of the season. Then he got injured. He hasn't really been getting the same minutes. But I just think this team is so well built from 1 to 13, just like the Bucks. So with all that being said, that is why I have them at my number one power ranking spot. Is there one team here, though, Jamie, that looking back on it, you think they can make a huge jump before the playoffs? Ooh. Or fall back before the playoffs, either or. I think if we're going to talk about fall back, it could be Dallas. Because Dallas, is the, um, they're out of the plan right now. Um, which is crazy to say. So I think Dallas is going to have the biggest fall off. But I think the team, if there's going to be a team to make a push for the finals. Um, or just power ranking, stuff like that. I could see at the end of the season, Phoenix, uh, Sacramento, or Cleveland. Yeah, those are good takes. I definitely completely agree on the Mavericks. They've just kind of fallen apart right now. Same with the Nets. So, yeah, like, thou- yeah, thousand percent the yeah. Nets. I mean, for rightfully so. I mean, Ben Simmons is gone, and obviously Kyrie and Katie have been gone for a minute now. But I'd say Nets and Mavericks to fall back. And then the jump up, I, I agree with the Suns. I think the Heat, they have really caught their flames yeah, they've been good. in the last 10, 7-3, and two-game winning streak, and they might overtake the Knicks for that five spot. So i say the Heat could definitely be another team to continue lighting their torch. Nice. So uh, that's all we have for you guys today. It was a very jam-packed podcast. I thought this was a fantastic podcast. It was a podcast. great podcast. I, 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 I enjoyed this. Just us two today. Um, with just us two, that was uh, that. that's our last combination of just two people. Because exactly. we've had a podcast where it's been Nick and Alex. We've had one where it's been me and Nick. So now it's just me and Alex. <laughs> that's the last of the combinations of it being a two-person. So with all that being said, I want to give a big thank you all for tuning into WVUA 90.7 FM and the Full Court Press Podcast.